Welcome to the Wide World of Esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today, my guest is Agregati Siegel, the founder and CEO of the GameSync family of companies. Our topic is GameSync Esports Consulting. All right, welcome, Agregati. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I've been a big fan of yours watching your shows for many years and thank you so much for your service to the tech and esports communities we appreciate it all right thank you so much um so you have really interesting companies tell us let's start with game sync what is game sync so game sync was born out of a technical support company that i started uh, in san diego california back in 1999 and I pivoted to gaming and esports from that business in 2012. I had traveled around Asia and I saw the rise of esports and competitive gaming, and it hadn't really hit here in the US. Um, and so I was able to open a purpose built first to market facility in 2012. And sure enough, in 2013, the word esports became the big buzzword. And of course, we started to see that grow. And it's been growing ever since. And so uh, that's kind of how GameSync started as a brand. Um, but then, um, you know, over time, I started to see how other centers were operating. They would open and then they would kind of close. <laughs> I was wondering, well, why is that? And I started to figure out from my own experience running my center and then looking at other businesses that there really needed to be um, more of a framework and a better vision and kind of understanding about how communities work. And so building off of that experience, uh, I launched a consulting company called Games and Consulting uh, some years later. And then now I've been sort of doing that full time since 2017, uh, helping businesses open new centers and then also helping existing centers kind of grow their revenue and income streams and look for different opportunities. Because I think gaming centers and physical locations have really changed over time, especially coming out of COVID. And so there's a lot of interesting dynamics to it now. And so I'm trying to serve people in their journey in the, in the gaming world, you know, again, as it relates to these physical locations, these kind of digital hubs. So let's go back to the, the dark ages of 2012 or 2011, when, when this all came to fruition. Was it even called esports then? I, I had never heard the term. Um, it actually was not used at all. Uh, and I think, you know, when I opened in 2012, I was trying to figure out, well, what are people looking for? Like, what's going to bring people to these venues? And one thing I saw with it was at that time was that there was definitely a need for access to fiber, you know, access to high quality Internet, access to quality equipment. Um, but then beyond that, uh, of course, I started to realize that the social gaming aspect and community was really uh, an important draw because it's like eating at home versus going to a restaurant. You know, you can only eat so many meals <laughs> at home before you realize I got to go out. And I think it's actually the very same thing with gaming is if people really want to connect and socialize and meet other people and share in their hobby. Um, and then in 2013, we saw the rise of League of Legends, which I see as sort of the the banner title that really brought esports into the fold, both here on a collegiate level as well as just on a casual amateur level. So League was really one of those titles that um, exploded in popularity. And the next thing I knew, there were people coming in that just wanted to play League of Legends all the time. And so I started to realize, okay, well, with League, you have a team of five. Because so now you have a dynamic of a team. It's not an individual playing against, you know, a computer or even just playing other players online. You have physical uh, interaction and you have that body language and chemistry and team building. And so that's sort of, to me, what really started to catapult. I mean, of course, you had competitive gaming going back to the early 2000s. And one of our friends here in San Diego is um, a fellow by the name of Jordan Nothing Gilbert, who was a famous Counter-Strike player back in the day. Uh, he played for Cloud9, among other teams. And, you know, he would come into our center and we would have people sort of flock in if they heard that he was coming to play Counter-Strike at one of our tournaments. And we were just running casual tournaments, but he would come in and appear. And so word got around. There was kind of like this buzz online. So I also started to realize the, uh, you know, sort of the net effect and the power of the 
the influencers. Of course, we live in an influencer economy now. So this was another interesting facet to it. And, um, you know, in subsequent years, we've had events here in San Diego like TwitchCon. And we, we've we also had, um, you know, just recently uh, other really well-known gaming events that have brought all these people together. Um, and I think the connective, the connective tissue of people coming together to play games, to do the things they love, has really been the impetus that has taken us out of sort of a non-esports, non-competitive world here in the US, you know, specifically into the thing that you've seen in Asia for many, many years now. We've all heard of South Korea and their giant tournaments for StarCraft with 100,000 people. So you know, you're starting to see some of that here, but I, I, I'm a big uh, small business passionate owner type of personality and I really like the small business owner coming into their community and offering up these kind of digital tech hubs, which I said before are more now like flex spaces to me where you can bring in education, you can bring in other pieces and sort of create a, a well-rounded experience for, for kids and adults. So, you know, in the past, and I think now even in Asia, they'll call them land centers. And then, so, you know, now it's more like gaming centers or esports venues. Um, so, have you, as you, you mentioned that um, entrepreneurs in gaming, that they failed initially, what, what were the primary reasons for failure and how, what are your tips for success? That's a great question. Um, I feel like a lot of it actually has to do with the technology, the infrastructure. So, you know, again, I have a really big tech background. And what I found over time was that these centers were not actually deploying efficient um, in IT and information systems and models to sort of streamline their deployment. So we're talking about, for example, the gaming PCs. Well, what does that look like? You know, do you buy from a retail provider? Do you build your own? And what are the pros and cons of those? Then you've got things like servers. I mean, quite a few center owners, even today. Um, I just recently was uh, in Houston, Texas, working on a center there. And the uh, video I put out kind of went a little bit viral of the deployment that I did, which was PCs booting onto a server. I use a software called CC Boot and iCafe Club, really powerful purpose-built softwares for our industry, for gaming centers. And even just in the last week, I've been getting calls and messages from all over the country. Where center owners, these are people that already have businesses. In fact, one year in California just called me. I said, how did you get the computers to boot onto a server and manage it all centrally? I said, well, how many computers do you have right now and how are you running it? He said, well, we have you know, 30 computers and they're all booting individually, each machine locally. So local content, everything on a local drive, and there's no integrated sort of umbrella system for centralized management. And as you know, when you update these games and new releases come out, there's a constant software influx. So you have to con continually sort of download and upgrade the software. And if you don't do that, when customers come in and they wanna play, you know, they gotta wait for updates. And that's the whole thing with gaming centers. People just wanna walk in, sit down and just start doing their thing. So <clears throat> I would say that um, you know, the lack of having the correct IT deployment is a huge thing that has caused centers to crash and burn. Um, you have to think of these businesses as IT projects through and through. And so that also has to do with the network piece. Um, I used a company called Zyxel, and they have incredible single pane of glass interfaces for managing the entire network. So in one view, you can kind of see everything what's going on and you can manage it from your phone. Same with the iCafe Cloud CC Boot software. It's all web-based, it's all cloud managed. And so center owners, you know, they're trying to market their business, they're trying to run events, they're probably getting into education and STEM and STEAM. And so you're dealing with a million things. The last thing you wanna do is have to deal with the technology. So I would say that is a big piece um, is the entire IT area. And then another piece I would say is these are not the cyber cafes of the 90s. You know, back then, you just had somebody sitting at the desk and you had high speed internet and people could go and access their email and get on AOL or whatever the case would be. Um, I was like a small jab at you because I knew you got the AOL email address. That just, just that's, that's actually an antique. It's, yes. really, it's a valuable antique. Correct, and I appreciate and admire everything to do with that. But as an analogy to those days, 
uh, you know, people were using it for utilitarian purposes, right? Well, today, I don't think that's enough. So if a center owner wants to sit there and kind of just expect that people will come in, um, I don't think that's a sustainable business model. And so what I try and work with center owners on is, you know, how to create and develop these different revenue drivers and income opportunities, and maybe also find some passive ones too. There's quite a few things out there if you start to really look into it. And so um, it really just comes from experience. And after 13 years of doing this, I feel like um, I finally have uh, really sort of crafted a nice model. And it's a lot of complex pieces. There's no defined way to build these venues. You know, it's a very organic process. And I would say that's another reason why I think centers close is because it is organic and there isn't a whole lot of structure. It's very easy to make mistakes in one, one or more areas. So I guess that's my answer. So when you look at um, eSports centers before COVID versus after COVID, is there any change? And I guess we have to look at the during COVID too. So how how has it evolved before, during, and after? Sure. Um, I mean, again, I can tell you from a consultancy perspective. So one of the things I do is I offer free consultations and kind of from a high level perspective, help people to see if it's the right business for them or if they're really serious about going forward, I try and help them perhaps with their business plans or other aspects of it. And so because I offer initial work for free, I do get a lot of calls and emails and contacts. And I remember before COVID, uh, especially like in the year leading up to it. Um, so we're talking really 2019. I mean, my phone was ringing off the hook and I was absolutely slammed with work. Um, and then into COVID, you know, there were clients that I was working with to help open their centers. They actually did open during COVID. This is an extremely difficult thing, but they did. Um, and then, you know, of course, my the, the calls for initial consultations and to ask about opening a center went down quite a bit in the COVID time. But as soon as things opened up, I started getting calls again. And I would say now I've basically reflated back to where I was pre-COVID in terms of my call volume and just being able to have conversations with business owners about, you know, setting up these types of facilities. So I think we're there. And I would also add that, you know, the online viewership of esports really has affected the overall global consumption of esports. And the more viewers are watching online, this absolutely translates into more people wanting to come to physical centers. And so during COVID, while everything was under lockdown, you know, there were no sports, people were watching esports online. And so Again, coming out of all this, you see a much bigger kind of addressable market for esports, and it just continues to grow year over year. It's it's quite something, actually. You know, so you mentioned passive income. Would that in, would that be merchandise then? Um, and 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 also, is there an element of providing food and beverages in these centers to uh, to increase income? Absolutely. Um, all the things you mentioned, <clears throat> there's also quite a few others. Uh, I started thinking about, in addition to sort of traditional uh, revenue, and yes, concessions is certainly a big part of it. I often talk about the analogy uh, that these are like movie theaters, where especially on the weekends, you're going to have a lot of people come in. You'll probably have a line out the door, you know, if you market your business right and you have the right atmosphere. Um, and this could even happen from when you open the business. You know, I think there's a lot of pent up demand, but like a movie theater, you have concessions, food, snacks, drinks that play a large role in the income model. And then additionally, um, you know, the merchandising aspect really ties into the branding of your business as kind of a fixture in the community, you know, again, as it relates to esports and gaming. So I think that is a huge piece. Um, I've developed a, an online brand for myself, actually, with GameSync. And so I have an online merchandise store at gamesync.gg where people can actually buy product and i do this uh print on demand but a lot of people will want to have you know right there in the store a point of purchase you have shirts you can have jerseys and then if you support local esports teams now you've got your own sort of sub brand uh, you know coming into the the esports competitive side with teams um i found a really interesting one in bitcoin atms i don't know if you've seen these around but these are sort of like ways for people to buy cryptocurrency uh, and they can, you know, go up to a machine and do this. And apparently it's quite popular. So I contacted one company about 
partnering up to deploy these out at esports centers. And I actually have one at my center. They, they, they pay me rent to have it deployed there. So I think there are, and then that's passive income for a center owner. So that's another example of kind of a creative idea or a way of generating some income sort of outside of the traditional ways. But there are so many different ways to effectively make money with the business. Um, it's about you know, what the center owner wants to do, what their vision looks like, what their budget is for opening a center, you know, how many square feet and how many game stations are they going to have, what kind, and, you know, are they going to be doing education and is it going to be competitive tournaments there? So there's many different, different ways. So have you um, worked on any projects regarding um, esports in cinemas? Because I know that that's you know, use of that space, uh, you know, is happening. I was actually contacted by a cinema here in San Diego and I went and toured their venue. Um, so I've been running Super Smash Brothers Ultimate on the Nintendo Switch tournaments since 2018. Uh, I think we actually might have the long, longest running one in um, North America, uh, or certainly among the most longest running. It's We only stopped for COVID and we never actually stopped before and after the rest something like 161 or something like that. And uh, we do it every week. And um, so because we are known locally for these tournaments, uh, that this, yeah, this venue contacted me and the theater wanted to explore the idea of running Smash tournaments in their venue. And I would say the biggest problem we had trying to make that work was the kind of lack of refresh rate and visual performance on a larger display. So when you do competitive events, what gamers want and expect, and it really makes sense if you think about it, is the high refresh rate, the high frame rate, the low latency, and kind of like really that high performance experience because every movement you make and everything that you do is all kind of kinetic and connected into what's on the screen and your controller. And so when you start to get into some of these venues, the platform kind of breaks down. And so this is also another mistake that I saw owners make in the past, coming back to your point about making mistakes, um, they would think center owners, some of them, that a television would actually work for a competitive event. Because when they think console, they think your couch at home with a big screen TV and you're kind of laid back, right? Actually, that's not the case. For the most part, competitive console gaming is on a high refresh rate performance monitor, you know, not unlike you'd see on a computer. And so, yeah, you can have the casual chilled back giant TV, but that would be more for like maybe a birthday party or for casual gaming or something that's non-competitive. And so I think that kind of same line of thinking may, may apply to movie theaters, but there are also creative ways to do it where it's maybe not so serious and it's a little more fun and just more casual. So it just, again, depends on you know, who's your audience and what is the expectation. What, would, you, would you advise a... Um, game center to invest in professional esports chairs for good ergonomics. I mean, it, I would think that people would sit longer and they might spend more money if if they're comfortable. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? So my general take on everything having to do with purchasing equipment, furniture, chairs, tables, and kind of really all the purchasing having to do with the center, I, I really think should be done in a way that really not only maximizes your ROI, but also goes for top quality first. So like buy good things. Um, I'm not a big fan of branded products in the venue because I feel like psychologically, it's much better to have your own brand and kind of wrap that in the center. So I'm really not a big fan of, oh, buy an Alienware computer. Well, I can buy Alienware at home. You know, show me what's unique about your center. Well, oh, you're building your own PC and it's got this really cool case that I've never seen before and it's mounted on the wall and it's glowing like that. I've never seen that. And so that's a draw. The chairs, it's the same thing. Um, there are good chairs out there. You can, you can easily buy those online. Um, but I think branding the chair with your logo is ideal. And in a perfect world, you have both. You have a high quality chair that doesn't sag after six months. Unfortunately, you do see in chairs that are, you know, sub $300, they often use foam that is sort of like a filler material that in three or six months, now your chair is sagging. And remember, you have to think commercial venue. This is not the same as an individual at home, you know, playing for just in, you know, with them in their own space. You're in a community space and it's a commercial environment in, in a retail setting. So 
I would definitely say, um, you know, chairs, tables, things that are really, um, you know, maybe a little bit more branded to your uh, logo and design, color scheme even. I have a list on my website of partners that I've vetted over the years. And so I try and offer sort of a full stack solution. But, you know, these are only just my recommendations. Of course, center owners can do whatever they want. But I, I tried to find, like for the desks for eSports centers, this was not easy. They're basically more or less cheaply built across the board in, in, in the consumer retail side of things. So I, I went to a, a, a brand that had, uh, you know, built custom furniture for us so we could have high quality, you know, machined parts that are metal that kids can, you know, kick them around and beat them up. And they're not going to fall apart. Everything's going to sort of stay structurally sound. This just comes from owning a center for a decade and seeing everything and also making mistakes. You know, I made a lot of mistakes in my early days. So now I'm just trying to help people to not make those same mistakes and, and do a lot better. Do you do you uh, recommend uh, focus on certain games in in a particular center? So I think um, each community will have its own games and I have a specific strategy for that for owners and what they tell them is I simply say, look, you know, you're opening your center. You don't exactly know what your community likes, and especially on the PC side. And, you know, certainly with console, we could identify the top games and with PC, but you may find that people come in and they want to play some niche titles. So what you do is you simply be prepared to purchase games on demand. And of course, most of the games that people play are these days called FTP or free to play games. So here you don't have that issue where you have to buy licenses, but there are a lot of commercial licenses, you know, that you would need to purchase for certain titles that are popular. But if you don't know how many licenses or what titles, if the customer comes in and they tell you at the counter, you know, do you have this game? And, you know, it's, again, assuming you have the proper IT platform and infrastructure set up in the way that, you know, I advise people how to do it, then the counter help can actually go ahead and purchase the software right there, put it on a server and make it available sort of globally within the land center, the physical location, almost instantaneously. And so now every single computer is going to have that title. And this is to me like a really awesome way to serve the local community and show that, yeah, we're listening to you. You want a game? Okay, I'll buy it right now for you. Install it, boom, it's done. And then of course, when they leave, that game stays in the library of the center and anybody wants to come in and play that game later, they're able to do so. So that's kind of the win-win that we sort of look for in this. And what about marketing? Do you, how do you recommend that they proceed with marketing? Is it, um, what channels would you would be best for a smaller um, game center? So I've built all my businesses over the years, starting first and foremost with a website. Uh, I do website design. I'm a web developer for many, many years. And um, so my site for my gaming center, which is gamesync.us, is a really good example of bringing people in to a center. Um, what excites them, what makes it attractive, the content, the design. So I think that first and foremost to me is sort of the underlying base for all of this. And then of course, you know, you extend that out with other layers, a social media layer, you start to build an email newsletter and send, you know, marketing emails and things of that nature, partnering with local businesses. Probably that could be a whole video unto itself, kind of how to market your center. <laughs> Another video could be how to set up your center. But, um, you know, from an umbrella perspective, it's, I would say, traditional marketing in terms of the digital piece, you know, and online, but then refined and sort of niche targeted for the gamer and for the esports uh, gaming world. So that's sort of a high level answer. There's obviously a lot more to it. So, you know, it's interesting that there are some reality shows where a consultant comes into it like a bakery and works with the with the owner in terms of trying to turn it around. Um, are you are, are you able to go into a, a game center and even if it's not a reality show, help them to try to turn around their business so that it's profit profitable? Well, I will say that um, I've done this quite a bit, but it was largely, you know, centers that were kind of doing okay. It wasn't so much that they were sinking because, you know, I think at that point, it's very difficult financially to kind of do the things you need to do. What you should do is ideally forecast out, you know, your trajectory. And then hopefully you realize earlier on that I would need to pivot in some way. And then, yeah, I think um, it's worked out in some cases, some centers I'm thinking of right now, you know, they were doing okay. 
and now they're doing great. And so, uh, you know, I just implemented quite a few different things to sort of change the model. And in changing the model, changing the technology, changing the brand, even redesigning the logo, the website, uh, the activities and events, after school education, and some other pieces, we brought all that together, and businesses saw four to five hundred percent, you know, increase over time. So this is quite a big transformation. It's a lot of work, but I think it's worth it. So, what do you think the future of esports game centers is? Flex spaces. I think you're going to see a big educational piece. I also think you're going to see parents dropping off their kids after school for esports practices, just like you see in traditional sports where you have, you know, a football field or a soccer field and you have parents and teachers and coaches and kind of the support infrastructure. Well, that's what you're going to see with esports centers. And that's what I'm working on, you know, in the ecosystem of trying to help these businesses open, because I think from a larger perspective, we need these facilities. Um, if you're going to have this kind of esports integration in a larger scale, we definitely need to have centers and venues. These types of locations are really important. So I'm super passionate about kind of helping people to get those businesses open and then grow their businesses. So I would say flex space with education, esports tournaments, and then obviously, of course, having more of the um, engagement as far as a casual play and, and interactivity from an entertainment perspective. You bring all of that stuff together. Fantastic. Okay. So I'm sure that there will be a lot of viewers who would be very interested in finding you and having you help them. How can people find you? So the easiest way is to just go to the website gamesync.consulting. Uh, you could also Google gamesync consulting or even just gamesync and a number of different businesses will pop up. I've a few. And so sometimes people get confused because we do other things, but games and consulting is specifically for the esports center development for both new, you know, and existing facilities. And it can be a school. It doesn't have to be an individual, individual business owner. It could be any kind of gaming facility, really. Oh, terrific. This has been very helpful. Uh, Agregati, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you. And keep up all the great work and your service. We really, really appreciate it. Gratitude to you. All right. Anyway, thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Make sure to tune in next week. My guest will be Kelly Uioka. See you then.